The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. What you can say for the general public is or non-physicists, or even most of our colleagues, is kind of not so obvious, but most physicists know that quantum mechanics is cool. (laughs) And the message is it's a lot cooler than we thought it was. This is Duncan Haldane. He is the Sherman Fairchild University Professor of Physics at Princeton. And, uh, oh yeah, he shared something called the Nobel Prize in 2016 for his work on condensed matter physics. Today on Into the Impossible, a podcast of stories, ideas, and speculations from the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, physics is cool and sometimes very hard to understand. We're going to look at the very, very small and the very, very large with two of the most celebrated minds in mathematical physics, Dr. Haldane and the formidable Sir Roger Penrose, both of whom spoke with the Clarke Center Associate Director and astrophysicist Brian Keating. In part one, we'll go into the 2016 Nobel Prize and the quantum world with Dr. Haldane. With Dr. Penrose, we'll explore how his visual imagination has impacted his scientific ideas in part two, before delving into the picture of one of those big ideas in part three, which has to do with the scale of the universe and the work of M.C. Escher. As you might imagine, they talk about some mightily difficult to understand things. So in addition to gleaning something about how these figures think up and develop their ideas through mathematics, imagery, stories, and all kinds of seemingly chance interactions with other human beings, we'll also consider how we deal with the seemingly inexplicable. There's this idea out of science fiction that I find really fascinating. There are a few versions, but they all look at how the increasing specialization of knowledge makes it harder and harder for non-specialists to know if something is true or not. The sheer amount of rigor and study required to fully understand certain branches of science, for example, suggests that we layfolk have to take the unveiled truths of science as faith, trust scientific authority without being able to follow the same mental steps to confirm the truth of those truths. And in some cases, like Ted Chang's story in the form of a scientific paper called The Evolution of Human Science, metahumans get better than us at advancing that knowledge to the point that the best human scientists are left to pour over metahuman-generated scientific research like their holy texts, only able to glean glimpses of the discoveries themselves. That's how I felt trying to understand exactly what Duncan Haldane won the Nobel for. And it's nice to know that I have some good company in that. Uh, and I thought we'd just start with a very brief introduction for our listeners as to uh, the the occasion or the the accomplishment for which you were awarded the Nobel Prize. I'll just read the citation. You won uh, uh, your Nobel Prize for your work in condensed matter physics, and you shared it with Michael Kosterlitz, who was my professor at Brown University a long time ago, and David Thalys for <laughs> theoretical discoveries of topological phase transitions and topological phases of matter especially in quantum systems confined to two-dimensional surfaces. So this is not something that's, you know, on the tip of everybody's tongue. Uh, Is there any possible way, uh, we've we've seen the contortions that the Nobel Committee went to to try to explain Mm -hmm. uh, your work. Uh, I wonder, is that uh, fundamentally irreducible? As Feynman said, if I could explain it to you, it wouldn't be worth a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or can can one actually explain it in a way that's as comprehensible as as possible? Well, I don't know. I mean, thanks, Brian. Uh, I, I have a quote, which may be a misquote from Feynman, which says that if you can't explain the um, the Pauli exclusion principle or the spin statistic theorem to your grandmother, you don't understand it properly. <laughs> which he went to say, he did, which we don't understand. So I don't know. I mean, the the quantum mechanics is this mysterious thing that uh, uh, physicists get by 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 just taking it taking it for granted and not worrying about it while the general, uh, philosophers and the general public kind of spend, find it incomprehensible. But it seems to be the way the, the universe works. It seems to be the way the world works. And um, the only way I've really come up, come up with ex- explaining these things is that quantum mechanics can do really cooler things than we thought possible. Mm. And uh, so that's part of the excitement. This This whole topological physics has been a incredibly ins- inspiring to, and uh, to young people. In fact, it's got a whole lot of 
young people very interested in, in, in physics. It's because somehow a very powerful and clean idea like topology from mathematics turned out to allow one to, to think about uh, very constructively about these properties of quantum mechanics. And until this happened, topology was just not there in quantum mechanics. Let's take this piece by piece. What is topology? Topology is a branch of mathematics concerned with how properties of objects are preserved when they are stretched, deformed, or twisted. A circle is topologically the same as an oval, for example. It's a stretched circle. But all the possible positions of a hand on a clock are also equivalent to a circle, according to a topologist. Mathematically, topology is really, really good at describing three-dimensional surfaces. And Haldane, with the others he shared the Nobel with, pioneered some really hard math that worked really well when used to understand unusual phases or states of matter beyond the common three. The common three being gas, liquid, or solid. At really low temperatures, weird states occur, like superconductivity. That's when an electrical current can pass through an ultra-cooled material with zero resistance. That shift from plain matter to superconductive matter and similar changes in state like superfluids is something Haldane's work has been able to explain. And by being able to explain it, it has allowed scientists to begin to develop new materials that exhibit and exploit these properties, perhaps even paving the way for things as far out there as quantum computers, something Haldane himself used to consider a pure science fiction fantasy. It seems to me that your discovery with your, with your colleagues, um, you know, part of it, it really... Uh, made physical a very abstract notion of topology, yeah. which is, you know, sort of the connectedness. I mean, you show these yeah. beautiful uh, uh, images of, you know, pretzels and of coffee cups yeah. and, and donuts and things like that that made me very hungry. Uh, um, but but in addition, these are these are purely mathematical concepts, yeah. which you reduce to a physical entity, to a notion that really is, you know, I always say to, to my students, I can't hand you a triangle. I can only hand you the notion. During the Nobel Prize ceremony, the presenter held up a bagel, a pretzel, and a cinnamon bun, and not because he wanted to highlight the variety of offerings at your local mall. Topology describes objects with set number of holes, and these are the only things a topologist really cares about, the number of holes. The bagel has one, the pretzel has two, and a cinnamon bun is holeless, unless you pop out that rich, gooey part in the middle. The differences between the objects, cinnamon, pecans, flower composition, savory or sweet, are not important. But when a material switches between state to become a superconductor, it's like a bagel turning into a bun. There's a, a famous joke about this. So it starts, uh, you know, what is a topologist? And the answer is someone who cannot distinguish between a donut and a coffee cup. Get it? Eh, each one only has one hole. As you might guess, <laughs> quantum physics night at the comedy cellar is a little bit complicated. You know, jokes are seen in light of Schrodinger's cat and they simultaneously kill and do not kill. The atmosphere gets very, very uncertain. For Hal Dane, the 2016 Nobel began back in the 1980s and involved a chain reaction of hints, discoveries, and new applications distributed between various colleagues and universities. So I think everything has really come together through no one individual, but but generally a recognition, something new showing up, and then when something new shows up, it takes a bit of time to put it in context. Mm -hmm. But all this stuff, the new things that showed up, and it turned out two things I contributed, I wouldn't have said they were connected in hmm. any obvious way. I didn't know the connection, and it only later with work of Shagan Wen, uh, who, who, who set up a, 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 a systematic classification of, of topological states, and it turns out the magnetic atom thing is in some sense the hydrogen atom, the, the simplest example of a, right. of a topological state it's of matter. 
you created much of the the, the work that that led to the Nobel Prize you know, 30, 40 years ago, and yet and and I remember hearing about it not just from my you know mm-hmm. my stat Mac professor Michael Kostelitz, but but I do remember you know hearing whispers that that you guys were going to win the Nobel Prize, and it was sort of a foregone conclusion. Uh, you know, a what you know what? No, I don't think it was a foregone conclusion. I think this stuff was very interesting to theorists. Mm-hmm. It, it was a lot of you know. It, it was controversial and the people the theorists were interested. But I think what really made this uh, prize possible was the, the actual uh, development, probably by uh, Charlie Kane and Millie, that they, they took, they, they pushed my work in a way that I hadn't. I mean, I'd actually thought of pushing it in that direction too, but I never actually, it, I, I took a view that I didn't actually do the calculation. I thought about, Exactly the same generalization, and uh, but then I thought once you make it realistic, it won't work. And the amazing thing, which actually Charlie Kane told me that they tested by doing a calculation. I assumed what the calculation would be in advance of doing it, and never did it. So mm-hmm. I assumed there was no point in doing it because it wouldn't work. Right. Charlie says they they anyway they didn't think they see why it would work, but they put it on a computer and checked it out, and they found there was a new principle of uh, involving. Um, a fermion parity, which was not obvious, mm-hmm. and that led, and the fermion parity invariant, topological invariant, led to the three-dimensional case. And once again, it took work by others like uh, uh, Andre Bernavik and Xu Chen Zhang were kind of looking at this stuff, and, and the original models were again very not not very practical, and they didn't work out for graphene, but. These things require three three levels of things to come together. One is, I think that there's some deep underlying and abstract principles which are there to be found, but they're very difficult to understand and work with. I think the toy model intermediary that you can actually do a calculation fully, mm-hmm. <laughs> see all the bits, how it all fits together, and, and maybe see something unexpected that you never understand. Why that works is it shouldn't really have worked, but it did to, to see that. And then finally, the third piece is for someone to actually make a con- connection to, to physical materials. Mm-hmm. And then the thing takes off. You mm-hmm. actually, to make a success, you need these, you need the underlying fundamental, but probably difficult and abstract stuff, which might be the mathematics in this case, the principles, the concrete calculation that really shows it up. Mm-hmm. And then the someone finding out how you actually make a real material. And of course, once real materials were found, then everyone was excited and was starting to search for them. And experimentalists, all experimentalists were showing movies of coffee cups right. changing into donuts and back <laughs> again. Right. right. <laughs> The Nobel Prize was originally framed as honoring science that provides the greatest benefit to mankind. When it's so hard for us humankind to understand the research that was honored by the prize, knowing where that benefit to humanity is can be difficult to see, which isn't to say it's not there. How, how do you see this creative process leading to the beneficence that Alfred Nobel envisioned to, to mankind? Well, uh, I think the... The deepening of the understanding of, of, of nature, especially quantum mechanics, is, uh, is a seed corn for all kinds of the future development of technology. And I think this century, I used to be, you know, skeptical and think, you know, that quantum computers were snake oil salesmen or snake oil. But, uh, just seeing how when people start to, to actually get serious about looking at things, how much the improvements of the, you know the uh, how long how long coherence can be maintained and how these things improve and just the effect of of people getting excited about something and working on it and how much it advance. I think we will see some kind of uh, uh, quantum information technology of some kind emerge. It may not be you know breaking all our credit card codes or. I'm not sure what it will be, if what what form it will take, and uh, you know it'd be difficult to predict what, you know, you know Maxwell wouldn't have predicted iPhones, right? <laughs> um, so so I think uh, I should underst- 
getting better un- understanding of, of the fundamental principles of, of how the world works is absolutely a benefit to mankind. Fantastic. Um, and it will actually, historically, it's always led t- to, uh, to useful things that benefit the man in the street mm-hmm. or the woman in the street too, right? I mean, it's a very, uh, it, it, it's a good, it's, I wouldn't bet against it. <laughs> very well. When we say it's difficult to see the benefit of research like this, we use seeing as a metaphor for knowing, a pretty common metaphor. And seeing is so integral to our ways of knowing, going back into prehistory, arguably more so than hearing, touching, tasting, or smelling. Very arguably, but still. It's why the Nobel Committee swung by the bakery before their award ceremony to pick up a bagel, pretzel, and bun. Quantum physics and cosmology present special challenges for seeing what these theories propose and for knowing what they represent. These are the things which are the furthest away from our everyday experience on the human scale, Mm -hmm. either on the very small or the very large, or they're all all weird. And so, uh, of course, we can't immediately, you know, get understand them by just looking around us. Uh, We, of course, need to look around us in very special ways for cosmology and for quantum mechanics. That's right. Um, with, uh, but yeah, so obviously if we're just kind of, you know, monkeys or something <laughs> around there, we'd be interested in bananas or whatever it is. <laughs> but these things are way beyond the issues of getting everyday enough, experience. getting an everyday, getting enough bananas right. or meeting other friendly monkeys or whatever. Which brings us to part two, going from quantum topology to the biggest scales of the universe with the man who proved the existence of black holes was Stephen Hawking, Sir Roger Penrose. Hello, I'm Roger Penrose. But first, with a stop in the visual imagination. Seeing problems and ideas of physics and mathematics comes naturally to Penrose, more naturally than most. This isn't a surprise if you're someone who's read his books, which are filled with expressive diagrams, or know of his famous Penrose tiles. So it's a it's a real treat to meet you uh, and to to uh, to be with you. You've been um, uh, an inspiration to me as a as a physicist since I was a young young man. This is actually a copy of your uh, one of your famous books. It's such an old copy that it, it only says <laughs> national bestseller on it. Uh, this is the Emperor's New Mind, uh-huh, right. uh, subtitle concerning computers, minds, and the laws of physics. Uh, I have this particular copy uh, almost uh, almost thirty years. This is from nineteen eighty nine. Original uh, paperback edition, which is all I could afford, and this was a uh, this is a wonderful book for me. Uh, although I could understand only approximately the square root of the number of pages within it, almost 500 pages. Um, and the charming fact about this book is that it not only described very advanced concepts in physics to a high school student like me at the time. But also had very whimsical drawings, and and I, I always thought that uh, you of all people, uh, especially you know famous for your your Penrose tilings uh, and so forth, uh, you might be the ideal person to talk about this um, notion that we at the Clark Center for Human Imagination are trying to investigate, and that's whether there are you know similarities between these two cultures, uh, between science. Uh, and the arts and and to bridge those gaps because in today's society so increasingly reliant on technology and yet perhaps less knowledgeable about it uh, and yet driven by passions in the artistic realm. Uh, mm-hmm. It seems like you've had a particularly interesting um, confluence of those two of those two branches of of culture, science and art. And I wonder if you could talk about what what sorts of artistic uh, endeavors, if any, have, have interested you. And and uh, as we go on, we'll we'll explore maybe if there are any parallels between art and science. Mm. Well, I should say that I came from an artistic family in the sense that my grandfather, my father's father, was a professional portrait painter and artist. Mm. And he was uh, extremely skilled at at sort of realistic art. Um, One of my father's brothers was Roland Penrose, Sir Roland Penrose, and he was very much part of the surrealist movement. Um, He uh, knew most of the big surrealists, Picasso in particular. He was a very good friend of, um, Max Ernst, Man Ray, various other people uh, that were at the time uh, active. And he uh, founded, at least he, I think co-founded the Institute for Contemporary Arts in England. Hmm. 
So uh, he, he was a big art, um, part of the, the movement, surrealist movement. Um, my father was very artistic too. I think all, there, were, he, there were four brothers, and I think as far as I know, all of them were very skilled artistically. My father was very good at, uh, I think pen and ink was his, one of his real skills, but he used to go and, and paint landscapes in, in oils, things like this. Occasionally I would accompany him and, and try my skills at that too. But uh, he, he was the one who um, certainly inspired me in an artistic direction as well as a scientific one. Hmm. So I think it was um, uh, Galileo's father, Vincenzo, <laughs> That's was a true. musician. And <laughs> he yes. inspired Galileo to, um, to look at things uh, – Orally, as in listening uh, with the mm. with the with the ear, and and you know famous uh, studies with the metronome and, and other devices that led Galileo to potentially develop. And at least that the story is not apocryphal. The story goes he was in a <laughs> church and was bored, and and he timed the swing of a of a yes. pendulum like lantern <clears throat> using his own heartbeat. And he was said to be you know to think think visually and as an mm. artist would. And of course, he had beautiful sketches and Sidereus Oh, yeah, he was Nunzi's. very artistic as well. And, uh, yes, in the normal sense of artistic. And in Sidereus Nuncius, he talks about uh, seeing something with the eye and that providing for him what he calls, quote, visual certainty. So <laughs> seeing the Pleiades, you know, illuminated uh, so brightly lit, he claimed that that was proof beyond visual doubt that they were innumerable stars heretofore invisible to the eye. Yes. And I wonder... When you've had, you know, your 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 Penrose diagrams, your Penrose tilings, all, and you do seem to think very artistically, and I wonder, you know, is that is that a key to your success? Is that something that, in retrospect, has been so 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 important to you? I'm certainly very much on the visual side. Mm -hmm. I, uh, when I was an undergraduate in mathematics, um, I mean, before I actually went to university, I I had sort of mathematical skills, and I thought, well, um, when I go to university, I'll find lots of other people who think the same way as I do. But instead, I found almost <laughs> more different ways of thinking about mathematics and other things than I'd experienced before. But one of the biggest differences is th whether people think visually or not. Mm -hmm. And I was very much on the visual side. Um, there were only about three of us in, in a class of, I don't remember, 15 or something, mm -hmm. who were really visual, um, primarily visual. And I've always thought myself as being in that direction. And I do tend to do my work by drawing pictures. Also, even calculations. This was when I was an undergraduate at Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And I had a problem which was set to me. Uh, and I was trying to see how to solve this. And at the my supervisor gave lectures on differential geometry. And he used to... Um, have the board filled with all sorts of symbols with lots of little indices all over the place and I couldn't make head nor tail of it so I decided to develop this notation in which you drew little pictures and all those little indices were lines and you joined them up and and I found this to be a very powerful notation which I used all the time for calculations involving tenses and things like that mm -hmm. including the problem that I was set and, and they were extremely valuable. And ever since that, I, I've used this notation for certain types of calculation. I mean, there's sort of this this notion uh, that uh, you know scientists have to be very you know cold and calculating, and artists can be freewheeling, free thinkers, <laughs> creative, uh, in abundance. But actually, I think Carl Sagan said something like uh, that. Uh, a scientist should be creative and an artist should be precise, something like to that effect. <laughs> I see. And I wonder. Yes, you know, that's an interesting comment. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, it has to be said that there is an awful lot of calculation which needn't be very creative in many scientific subjects. So it uh, involves a lot of calculation. One can be creative in calculations, of course. Mm -hmm. And certainly um, with the diagrams that I was drawing, then it did lead me in directions which were different from those that you would have um, using conventional notation. Partly, partly it was just that it was easier to represent certain things relative to when you're using the ordinary notation. You might want to avoid certain kinds of complication. But with the diagrams, it was not so complicated, and so it led one in different directions. Mm -hmm. So that, that was certainly a very valuable part of what I was doing. But then pictures anyway... 
they may not be this type of calculation, but I always used to try and understand things in a geometrical way. Mm. Um, and in fact, it was my first interest in cosmology really came about because I was listening to lectures given by Fred Hoyle mm -hmm. on the radio. And he was talking, I think there were five lectures, wonderful lectures there mm -hmm. were. And he started off very locally in the sense of the solar system and then he went out further and further out. And at the end he described the cosmological scheme that he was part of, mm -hmm. namely this steady state model of where the universe expanded but somehow it, uh, the material didn't get thinned out because new hydrogen was created. Correct. And this, so this kept on going and the universe kept on presenting more or less the same picture forever in both directions. But I started to try and understand this. And one of the things he said on the, on the radio talks was that the galaxies would move faster and faster away from us until they reached the speed of light. And then the light wouldn't get to you and so they would disappear. So I started drawing diagrams and I realized they wouldn't disappear like that. They would fade away. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very puzzled by this. So I've, I was in London at the time and I visited Cambridge to see my brother, who was, who was a graduate student in Cambridge. And uh, I said, look, I didn't understand this about what Fred Hoare said and so on. Does it make sense? And so he said, well, I don't know about these things, but sitting over on the table there is Dennis Sharma. <laughs> and Dennis Sharma was <laughs> a good friend of Oliver's. Right. And, um, and so I went and explained my problem to Dennis and, and he was interested and I think he went back and I talked to Fred or something and he realized that what I said was correct. Mm. And so, so he decided to, to put me under his wing. He, 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 I was doing pure mathematics right. at the time and I think he thought, you know, I should be trying. He wanted to convert me to cosmology, mm -hmm. yeah. which I didn't immediately do, but Dennis taught me an enormous amount of physics, the things that were going on at the time, not just cosmology, but other aspects of physics. And I sort of, that was my sort of conversion from physics, from, mm -hmm. from uh, pure mathematics to physics was largely um, due to Dennis. His theory of conformal cyclic cosmology is one of several models that pictures the universe as not just the result of one big bang. In these views, the universe goes through a series of bangs, expansions, and in one way or the other, begins again with a new bang, forever and ever. The story of how Penrose developed his cosmological theory has deep roots, going back to his work on the existence of black holes, which involves topology and Stephen Hawking, and evolved in response to new evidence. Can you explain your theory in, in cyclic com cosmological terms? Yes. Uh, and, and, and relatively, uh, in, in terms a layperson can understand, perhaps, which might be challenging, um, how does it work? How, how do you envision the origin of the universe, or was there an origin? Well, it's a good question. Um, of course, I had some influence from my, uh, my graduate, early graduate student days from Dennis and Fred Hoyle mm -hmm. and Herman Bondi and Tommy Gold, mm -hmm. who were the um, big steady-state people. And I had a certain feeling for that subject, thinking it, uh, it was really rather beautiful, the idea, and philosophically nice, that the universe somehow kept on going forever and had existed forever. And this scheme made a certain amount of sense, but this was kind of shattered when the um, discovery of the microwave background came and this was some pretty direct evidence that there was a very early stage of the universe which was extremely hot and dense. And uh, what I, one of the great things I admired about Dennis is though he used to lecture a lot about steady state and the wonderful features it had, but then when he became convinced by the cosmic microwave background argument, he, he auto openly said, look, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And I haven't heard many people right. you know, publicly... Uh, Even uh, uh, Jeff and, and Fred Hoyle continued to work on it until they... Oh, well, that's right. Day. He did, indeed. So, but Dennis was absolutely honest about it, mm -hmm. and when the evidence became strong enough, he said, no, I was wrong. So I followed him there and said, yes, the evidence is pretty good. We must believe in the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. uh, and, well, I proved some results early on about black holes primarily to show that a collapsing body, and according to Einstein's general relativity, uh, would become singular. So there were, were models that uh, were just before the war 
um, Oppenheimer and Snyder had shown that if you had a, an exactly symmetrical, spherically symmetrical body made of dust, which mm-hmm. was a material, which sort of theoretical material, which had no pressure, that this thing could collapse and produce this picture of what we now refer to as a black hole. But there was a lot of question in those days about these assumptions, most particularly if it was not symmetrical but irregular, you might expect the collapse would be a great mess Mm -hmm. and it could do all sorts of things. It might bounce and come out again and goodness knows what. But I was able to produce a a theorem which showed that it had to become singular Mm -hmm. uh, using sort of methods that people hadn't been using before. These were kind of topological arguments. And uh, then Stephen Hawking... Um, I became acquainted with him just after I produced this result and showed him these arguments. And then he developed them to produce arguments which applied to the whole universe so that you could imagine a a collapsing universe or it would be like a black hole but on a cosmic scale or the reverse of that which would be the creation of a universe according to Uh, the Big Bang scheme. And this would mean that it didn't have to be all symmetrical. It could be very complicated. Mm -hmm. And then we we had a theorem together which more or less encompassed all the results that that had come before. So if the evidence was in favor of a Big Bang, that left a few problems and lots of good blundering company. Now, the theory of inflation came along to try and explain, among other things, this is one of the things it was trying to explain, why the universe was so regular and symmetrical to a good approximation. And the argument was that there was this very early stage where the universe indulged in this, what's called an inflationary phase. See, we now have good evidence that in the remote future, the universe will keep on expanding um, at this accelerating rate. And this is what we seem to see. And that is a feature of... uh, It's present in Einstein's equations if you take the version of those equations, his modified version, which he he produced more or less two years after the original version, which the modified version incorporated what's called a cosmological constant. Now there does seem to be evidence that this was right. Mm -hmm. Einstein called it his greatest blunder because (laughs) he tried to make a model that was completely static and he needed the cosmological constant for that. And then when people said, no, no, the universe is expanding, so that model isn't right. And so Einstein said, oh, blast, I should have seen how to do that right. <laughs> without my cosmological constant. His biggest the blunder irony, was saying. Yeah. Yes, the irony is that it turned out to be true right. after all. That was his biggest blunder, <laughs> calling it his biggest blunder. <laughs> yes, Precursor. that was a blunder, calling it his biggest blunder. That's right. <laughs> so the remote future of the universe seems to be this exponentially expanding state which shows that we seem to have this cosmological constant. But then the idea of inflation is that there was a much earlier stage in the universe in something like 10 to the minus 32 of a second. I mean, you have to think of Mm -hmm. 10 with (laughs) 32 zeros, that reciprocal of that number of a second, which is a ridiculously (laughs) tiny fraction of a second. The universe did this kind of inflation thing uh, that it seems to be doing now on on a cosmic scale. And this was supposed to explain the uniformity of the universe and so on, various things like that. Well, I didn't like this idea at all. It seemed to me an artificial scheme. I didn't see how it was ever going to turn off once it got turned on, certainly in in a regular way. And I didn't see that it explained the regularity because I could see it could produce arguments to show that a collapsing universe with inflationary scheme in it would not smooth itself out. So it, it just didn't seem to me that argument was right. Penrose admits that in the years since cosmic inflation was first proposed, there have been better arguments developed, two or three at most, like the cosmic microwave background. But he still isn't convinced. And why he isn't convinced has to do with what happens to matter at the very beginning of the universe and the very remote future, two limits, and what that has to do with scale and the works of artist M.C. Escher. A lot of physics is not interested in the scale. And when I say this, I mean physics which doesn't involve mass. Mm -hmm. You see, if you have mass, that gives you clocks. This is uh, um, Einstein's E equals mc squared combined with Max Planck's um, E equals h nu. Nu is a frequency. Put the two together, that means mass and frequency are equivalent. Mm -hmm. Physically, this means if you have a stable massive particle, it is a clock an absolutely perfect clock because it's based on these two basic principles. 
So this is the kind of basis of geometry that you have in Einstein's theory. And the GPS systems that we all use depend on this extraordinary precision that we have in clocks. But if you don't have mass, this is the other side of the statement, if you have no mass, then you don't have clocks. Mm -hmm. And photons, particles of light, don't have mass. And if the central content of the universe in the remote future is mainly photons, let's say entirely photons mm -hmm. is the first approximation, mm -hmm. These photons don't know big from small. Mm -hmm. They behave no scale conform. built into them. The Maxwell's equations, which govern the way electromagnetism and photons work, are completely insensitive to the change in scale. Mm -hmm. So this says that the remote future doesn't know how big it is, mm -hmm. in a sense, if mm -hmm. there's nothing mass that's left. Some people will know about the Escher pictures that have, mm -hmm. you see, what are they called circle limits. There's one with angels and devils, mm -hmm. and they they're nice and big in the middle of the picture and as you go towards the edge they get all very crowded but you have to imagine that the universe these angels and devils inhabit is this entire infinite universe within the circle that you see in the picture they look as though they get very crowded towards the edge but the angels and devils think they're the same size as the ones in the middle they're only squashed conformally equally left and right as up and down um, but the infinity is this nice boundary, boundary. now in space time you can do the same trick you can say, if it's conformal, you can squash down this exponentially expanding infinity into a nice, flat, well, not, well nice smooth, Locally. I should say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a, like a, a time. It's time infinity, in a sense. But as far as photons are concerned, it's just like anywhere else. So they would go zipping through, and they wouldn't care. So this was one argument. I was worrying about the boring universe in the remote future. Right. And then photons don't get bored easily because they don't have an experience of the passage of time. This is where the massive scales and distant horizons of time get really interesting. Let's take you to the end of the universe. To get there, we need to think about the second law of thermodynamics. See, one of the great puzzles, for some reason, not normally, or maybe recognized, but not referred to by cosmologists, and I find this very puzzling, is the second law of thermodynamics. Now, what does the second law of thermodynamics say? It says, more or less, things get more random as time goes on. Mm -hmm. There's a measure of randomness, which physicists use, called entropy, and this entropy increases with time, and that's the second law of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. The early universe was smooth and dense. As the universe expanded, entropy increased, with a few very crucial results. You see, we gain everything, like the stars come about through clumping of material, and they shine. The sun shines. Biological and we, life. Uh, yeah, we mean, get life. Mm -hmm. We get everything from this imbalance of temperature, hot sun, cold background. Mm -hmm. And this is what we live off. As that expansion continues, and if the expansion was conformal... Wait, hold on. I, I think we need a new image to work with. You can, you can imagine... Uh, a picture drawn on a rubber sheet and you can stretch it one way or stretch it the other way and it gets distorted but if you stretch it always at once mm. then s small circles will remain circles you might do it a little differently in different parts of the rubber sheet but infinitesimal shapes will remain the same shape even though the scale may be bigger or smaller and that invariance is called conformal That's right, invariance. that's conformal invariance. Now, it's, uh, you can apply this to space-time structure. By the time we reach the distant future of the universe, entropy has reduced everything to photons, to light. Even black holes will have broken down into radiation. And as we learned, light doesn't have any sense of time or distance, no scale. So while we imagine the universe as massively expansive at that point, it is conformally on par with the low entropy state of the universe at the Big Bang, which we imagine is very, very small and dense. Which means one may lead to the other, cyclically. But then the other end of the scale is the right. Big Bang. The Big Bang, right. Now here you have the opposite picture. It's all squashed together. Mm -hmm. But if you have near the Big Bang, you've got extremely high temperatures. The temperatures are so high that the energy is in the motions of things and not in the mass of things. So the mass becomes completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. The closer you get to the Big Bang, the more irrelevant mass becomes. And so you can again think of the conformal picture. 
you've basically got only massless, like massless things. And so there again, they don't care what the scale is. Mm. So that's, that's pretty okay. I mean, that's not outrageous what I said here. What right. is outrageous mm -hmm. is that I say, okay, the Big Bang looks awfully like the remote future of a previous eon. Mm. So I say that there was another universe. I, don't, I like to think of the universe as all these things, not just one of them. Right. See, our own eon would start with a Big Bang, expansion, and then this exponential expansion in the remote future. And then you squash down the finity, stretch out the Big Bang. Now, I mustn't have inflation in this picture, yes. otherwise it ruins the early, mm -hmm. the early universe. It stretches however, out the compressed. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. However, there is a sort of inflation which is the exponential expansion of the previous eon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my claim is that those good things that inflation explains are, are also explained by the exponential expansion of the previous eon. And we don't need an artificial initial stage of 10 to the minus 33 seconds or whatever it is in mm -hmm. the very early stage. If you've got the remote future of the previous eon, temperature goes down and down, everything gets more and more rarefied, and you say that's as bad as different as you could imagine from, from the Big Bang. Mm. But no, because if you apply this conformal squashing of infinity, the temperature goes up. If you stretch out the Big Bang, the temperature comes down. Mm -hmm. The way things scale allows you to match exactly the very cold infinite universe. Squash now becomes the stretched out, very hot Big Bang. So and the densities will... scale exactly to, to match. So there are no singularities. There's no singularity oh, there. So that's a tremendous virtue, right? Because yeah. as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, in the inflationary model, you need a singularity. You do. And there are all sorts of problems mm -hmm. because it doesn't – just the things it doesn't do. Mm -hmm. and, and people are led to this rather horrendous thing what <laughs> called um, – Eternal, eternal inflation, inflation where you're allowed to. It might, might do it any minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We, yes. we should be mindful of it, right? <laughs> we, need, uh, yes. we need inflation insurance. That's right. And before we take a break to hear from our sponsor, Space Farmers Inflation Insurance, Dr. Penrose has even gone as far as to speculate that a message from the previous eon, created by some super advanced civilization, could be encoded in the cosmic microwave background radiation, allowing us to send messages, maybe even podcasts, from one universal eon to the next. You've been listening to Into the Impossible, a podcast of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at UC San Diego. We'd like to thank Drs. Duncan Haldane and Sir Roger Penrose for their time. Back in episode three, we featured an audio drama by Kim Stanley Robinson, narrated by the kind of quantum computer Dr. Haldane's discoveries might enable. So check it out. And if you're interested in other cyclic models of the universe, take a listen to episode five, in which we spoke with physicist Paul Steinhardt about his related theories. We would be remiss if we did not thank our generous patrons and sponsors, including Viasat Inc., members of the Founders Orbit and the James B. Axe Family Foundation. It's very much appreciated. To find out more about the Clark Center and other exciting projects, research, and programs, as well as how to support our mission, please visit imagination.ucsd.edu. Coming up soon, we have a live event with astronomer Jay Paskoff on October 10th and an evening with science fiction writer Andy Weir on December 7th, talking about his new novel, Set on a Lunar Colony. Audio production of the podcast is by Wes Hawkins and Patrick Coleman, produced by Patrick Coleman and Sheldon Brown. And thanks to everyone who's been listening and sharing. Please continue to do so. Keep leaving those reviews. We love it. And uh, we appreciate you listening. Thank you very much. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one.